This morning we'll be talking a little bit about uh, the tragedy in Uvalde. And so, parents with small children, I want to give you a moment. If you are protecting your children from that discussion, maybe you want to wait and talk to them yourself. We'll be talking about it a little bit today. I want to give you some time. There's a playroom right in the back. If you'd like to take your children there, you are welcome to. While uh, while they're sorting that out, a uh, quick announcement. So tomorrow <coughs> we are having a church social at uh, Don and Mayor and Dees Roberts. And what's Dees' last name? What is it? Yeah. Hammond. Okay, I don't know how to say I'll just say Don and Mayor and Dee, their house. And um, uh, uh, we're going to start gathering around, what, 2? Yeah and cook around 4.30 or 5, somewhere in there. Um, bring a meat that, that you can grill for your family and some side dishes and drinks and snacks to share around. And uh, there's a swimming pool there. If, you're, if you want to swim, your kids want to swim, bring them in your swim trunks. If you are visiting with us, we would love to have you attend, even though uh, uh, you're visiting. And so, um, Gray, if you'll stand up, please. If you'll stand up, Gray. There you go. And no, that gray. I'm sorry. Her. And Mayor, if you'll stand up, please. If you need an address to where the party's at, see one of those ladies. Thank you. All right. So um, this afternoon, they're going to be gathering together to set up the tables and the umbrellas and eat pizza. In what order does that happen? Is it the pizza first? I don't know. They may be famished. Anyway, uh, they could use some help setting up tables and chairs and umbrellas for tomorrow, and then there'll be some pizza there. So, uh, uh, And, yeah, you can take your suits and swim over there today, too. So see uh, Don and Marin D after the service if you would like to help. As I said, we're going to be talking a little bit about what happened with this last uh, school shooting. And... Um, there's a lot of conversation that's taking place. I'm sure you've heard many comments, much discussion. Uh, there's some who are saying uh, that obviously the solution to the problem is gun control. And then there's others who are saying obviously that's not the solution to the problem is dealing with mental illness. And then there are some who are saying, where is God in all of this? And it, it leaves, then leads to the question, what needs to be said from the pulpit? Um, and I, I think even as we look around this room right now, we can start to get a little bit of a preamble uh, to our societal illness. When 9-11 happened, the churches were packed. And for us today, it's just another holiday, just another day of travel, and the church is not packed. We've become jaded. So uh, I want to read a few verses to you in this context of what I believe needs to be said from the pulpits across the land this morning, even if only a few are listening. Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, from the mouth of Jesus. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. In Matthew chapter 16, Verses 2 through 3, again from the lips of Jesus. He answered them, and I've got the verses up here. You can go home and check in your Bible if you want to later. He answered them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. And finally, once again, from the lips of Jesus, prophet, king, sovereign God, 
Matthew 24, 28, wherever the corpse is, there the vulture will gather. In all three of these passages of Scripture, Jesus is speaking about the end of times. This is not that sermon. He's speaking about the end of times and his return at the end of the age and at the end of human history when there will be a new heaven and a new earth and when all that is will be consumed by fire and we will enter into an eternal bliss condition. Jesus is speaking of that event, but at the same time, he is speaking about an event in our history and in his listeners' immediate future, which was the absolute destruction of their nation, their capital, their land, that those who survived the war that was coming would be sold into slavery, but the vast majority of them would die in the streets. He was speaking of that event in A.D. 70 at the same time as he's speaking of the end of days. You have to understand in Scripture, and if you would apply yourself and become a student of Scripture, you will see throughout the Scriptures there are many days of the Lord, and there is one ultimate day of the Lord. The Lord has visited humanity many times, in days just like this. When the Bible speaks of the day of the Lord and when we look back at history at those particularly events, whether the day of the Lord at the Tower of Babel or the day of the Lord at Sodom and Gomorrah or the day of the Lord in ancient Israel by the Babylonians or the day of the Lord when Babel itself fell or Rome was sacked by the German hordes. All of the days of the Lord have certain things in common. They are a day of destruction and judgment on a people. They are a, if you will, a reset button. Only God spells it right. It's a day when when evil has reached such a point And the wickedness in the hearts and the action of men have come to a point where although God is merciful and God is patient and God is loving, if he allowed it to go one day longer, it would offend his justice and his righteousness and he would be accused of being an unjust judge. The day of the Lord is a knocking down of a dominant nation and the replacement of that nation by someone else, the lifting up of someone else. It's the common event in each of our historical days of the Lord. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles, please, to Isaiah chapter 63. I'm going to read to you for you, first of all, from Isaiah 63, a description of about a day of the Lord that already has happened in our history. And then we will look at the day of the Lord that is ultimate in our future. Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 6. Listen, particularly if you are one who says, God is merciful, God is graceful, God would never listen to these words. There, are, there is a question from the prophet and an answer from the Lord. The prophet asks the question, Who is this who comes from Edom? In crimson garments from Basra, he who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. Here is the answer from the Lord. It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to say the prophet's question. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress, God's answer, I have trodden the winepress alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. 
their lifeblood splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. Why was he alone? You might ask. Uh, doesn't he, won't he just need to use his vessel? Certainly, God himself would not be involved in such a gross activity. According to the scriptures, yes, he will. He says in verse 4, For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled. But there was no one to uphold, so my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the people in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. And this happened in the days of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. This happened after Isaiah's prophecies, exactly as Isaiah prophesied. The Lord wiped out all of the nations in the Middle East. And this is not an exaggeration. That's how the blood was splattered and flowed. Now for the ultimate day of the Lord, Revelation 14, 19 through 20, it's up on the screen. It says, so the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it in the, the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1600 stadia. Now, I would say to you, if you do not want to hear about a wrathful, vengeful God, please do not read the Bible that you have in your hands. Just put it aside and say, that's not the God I want to hear about, and surely there's a church somewhere that is pe preaching rainbows and butterflies. I want to read to you some other verses. Matthew chapter 12, verses 41 through 42, from the lips of Jesus Christ himself. The men of Nineveh will rise up the, at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented, or they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Let me just pause there for a moment. The men of Nineveh. The Bible says that Nineveh was so incredibly vile that God no longer could remain on his throne. He had to come down and once again tread the winepress. And he sent a prophet ahead of time named Jonah. And he told Jonah, I have a message for you. I have a warning for you to deliver. And you know the church didn't want to speak God's warning. but he made them. And Jonah walked into the center of it all and said, 40 days and you're done. And the people repented. And what Jesus says is this about the generation he was living in. Those people, as vile and wicked as they were, will stand up and condemn this generation because you are equally as wicked, but you will not hear the warning of God. June, uh, Jude, verses 5 through 7, reads as follows. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities 
which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Paul makes a statement that should haunt this Gentile church. In Romans 11.21, Paul says, If God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. You know, as young children sit in the back seat of the car and we're told that we're going on a journey, what the, you hear from the back seat is, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Well, friends, we're on a journey and it's not to Disneyland. And the question is, the abiding question, the haunting question should be, Pastor, are we there yet? Well, let us consider for a moment just looking from the back seat of the car at the scenery passing by and see if together we can answer that question. First of all, consider this truth, foundational truth about the universe you live in. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says this, In the beginning very foundation. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now listen, all things were made through him, and without him not anything made that was made. God created by his spoken word. And the second person of the Trinity is the living word of God. And through him, through the word of God, all came into existence. And you exist in that existence by his word. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 18 now says this. He, meaning the word of God, meaning Jesus Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation for by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And then it says this, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. What holds the nucleus of the atom together? What keeps the electrons spinning around it? What holds the periodic table together? What holds the very uh, molecules that make up the building around you? And what holds you together and keeps you from flying apart? The Word of God. Not only does He create, but He sustains. And if He stopped for an instant, all would be undone. Just consider that for a moment in the existence where you find yourself. That's just the way it is. Now let's consider our nation for a moment. At its inception, while it was still just a thought, and the war had not been won for the independence yet, the thought was there and the words came out and were recorded on a piece of paper, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And then there is this speaking of God at the foundation of who we are at a nation, as a nation is a confession and admittance. In fact, it was very much in today's vernacular, duh, of course he is. And of course he has made men free, and in a certain way. And of course, he has given them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Everyone knew in our nation at its founding that God was. 
self-evident truths we appealed to. Duh. Of course. And then when we began putting together our legal system, when we began codifying as a people, we believe this is right and this is wrong. Where did we get the standard? Where did the plumb line come from? From the word of God. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's ass or his wife. From the word of God, at the very core of who we are, was established in the fabric of our society, woven through every segment, our schools, our post office, our courthouses, everywhere was the word of God. It's what held us together. But we have systematically committed ourselves to purging from our society any mention of him or his word. We have systematically removed his word from every facet. And instead of the words, the United States of America has freedom of religion, now we shout, the United States of America has freedom from religion. You take the word away, what sustains? The molecules fly apart without the word of God. In fact, as we're looking out the windows at the scenery, would you just consider, there it goes right there, do you see how do we determine our moral values? What is right and what is wrong? Well, whoever yells the loudest, the most followers on Twitter, instead of the word of God, Twitter is the source of our wisdom and our moral value. Now maybe it's just we listen to somebody who says something we hear and we go, you take and lead us. You tell us what's right and wrong because I like what you're saying. Or whoever plays the dirtiest trick on their opponent. Whoever can sling the most mud. Violating. Slaughtering. The reputation. Of the pundits. They determine right and wrong. The answer is yes. Perhaps a movie star. With her 14th augmented surgery and her seventh marriage tells us what is right and what is wrong. That's where we're getting our moral compass. Maybe a football player. Politician. But we never, never go to the word of God. Never do I hear a politician say, in the Bible it says this, perhaps we should try that. Oh, here's another out the window. Do you see where we are? Do you see the scenery right there? In 2020, because this is the most recent year we have statistics, 45,222 people died from gun-related injuries. That's a lot of people. However, 54% of that 24,292 died of suicide using the gun. Are we there yet? Nearly 92,000 people in the United States died just from drug induced overdoses. 92,000 died from overdoses. That doesn't even speak to how many are using them. This is just the ones counted for overdose. And of those 92,000, 45,799 
did it on purpose to end their lives. Are we there yet? Do you see the scenery? Now, the shooting that took place. Again, a lot of people are talking about why wasn't this guard here or why does this person get to buy a gun or why did the police do this and why this, but there is something in my mind. I, I start going, am I like crazy? Am I, is there something wrong with me that this is where my mind goes? I'm trying to understand. I'm picturing in my mind what was he thinking as he looked over the sights into the face of a child? What is in his mind? I don't care about the rest of it right now. Who does this? In our sister church, the pastor's wife in our sister church is a doctor, and she's caring for one of those children in San Antonio whose hand is blown away as she sat her hand up to try to block the bullets that were crashing into her body. What was in his mind as he saw the little hand and kept pulling the trigger? She's healing. Her mother was in the hallway. If you ask, where was God? I just want to give you one glimpse of him. Her mother was in the hallway weeping. The doctor had to step out of the room for a moment to keep from crying over this broken body. Little 10-year-old girl. The mother's number one concern when she wakes up and she asks about her friends, what will I say? When the girl woke up, hallelujah, thank you, Lord, she asked about one friend, and it was the one friend who had not been there and been shot that day. Why do I focus so much on him right now? Why do I focus on the horror of what is in his mind? Listen, I'll explain. Again, maybe I'm just going nuts here. He is the product of our society. He's the poster child for the mental illness that is a pandemic across our land. And I am not talking about guns right now. I'm talking about the insanity of who we have become as we have left the word of God and his truths behind. Are we there yet? Luke chapter 1, verse 15 and 17, from the lips of the Lord. There's a little, there's a little part here that, again, a, a phrase in this that has haunted me for years. This is speaking about when John the Baptist is going to be born as a forerunner to the, the Messiah who would come into the world. And as the angel speaks to John the Baptist's father and is making this prophecy about who John the Baptist will be, he says, he will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Hallelujah. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Praise God. And then here's the phrase that kills me to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Does anybody read that and go, what? If there's one thing I know for sure, mothers love their babies and fathers love their children. If there's one thing, one piece of goodness in humanity, it is this, just naturally, always, except for the 62 million that were killed, mothers love their children. And always, except for over half of the population where the men have walked away from their homes and where children are growing up in fatherless homes, except for them, everybody, every man loves his child. 
this boy is the poster child of who we are as a people. Now, lest you think I am having a tirade against our culture, I am not. If you think that I am preaching against our society and against the lost, I am not. They're not here. But I would like to address the culpability of the church. I'd like to address our part in the where we are, because, friends, I believe, yes, we are there yet. How did we get here? First of all, Jesus said that the church is supposed to be the salt and the light. And if we look through the Old Testament and the New, the people of God served more than one purpose. And Jesus says of his disciples, you will be the salt and the light what was supposed to happen. Like yeast spread through the dough of the United States of America, like little pieces evenly distributed across the country, the church of Jesus Christ was supposed to stand between the lost world and a vengeful and wrathful God. The church of Jesus Christ was supposed to tell society the word of God. We were supposed to speak into society, thus saith the Lord. And we were supposed to be interceding in prayer for the lost world. And at the same time, just as when Abraham asked God, if there are ten righteous, will you relent? We were to stand and be righteous so that the wrath of God would be restrained. We were to restrain evil by our existence and being a people of the word and a people of godliness. And we were to restrain wrath by being righteousness in the society. And we stopped both functions. We stopped speaking the word of God and we began living in sin as much as the lost world and even more so. And there is nothing restraining him now. Will you turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 8? Ezekiel was one of the last men in his generation still serving as that lighthouse, as that speaker of God's word, as that speaking of, of godliness to power. He was one of the last ones. He's one of the last ones of God's men living in righteousness, restraining the wrath of the Lord. And one day the Lord visited him. In Ezekiel chapter 8, starting in verse 2, Ezekiel says, that I looked and behold a form that had the appearance of a man below and appeared to be, uh, his waist was fired above, his waist was something like the appearance of brightness, like gleaming metal. He put out the form of a hand and took me by the lock of my head. He picked Ezekiel up by his hair. He wanted to make sure that Ezekiel's eyes fell wherever God pointed. He wanted Ezekiel to see what God saw. Because until this moment, Ezekiel had not known had not been fully aware of the depravity in the house of God. And the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in a vision of God to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the gateway of the inner court that faces north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy. God took Ezekiel to church and said, I'd like you to see my church. Do you see right there? Right there at the gate coming in. The idol.
In verse 4, And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there like the vision I saw in the valley. And then he said to me, Son of man, lift up your eyes now to the north. So I lifted up my eyes toward the north, and behold, north of the altar gate, in the entrance was this image of jealousy. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abomination that the house of Israel are committing here. To drive me far from my sanctuary. His house. And he can't enter anymore. Because of the heart's the deceitful, adulterous, wicked hearts of his own people who lust after all the world has to give but has no desire for him. We sang as the deer pants for the waters. That is where the heart of God's people are supposed to be. But where are they? Comfort, comfort. The next electronic toy, the next great Netflix series, the next vacation. My dreams, I, here are the things that I want, and, I, and we pursue those the abomination that is in the house of God, and he can't even enter his own house. Then he said, verse 8, dig in the wall. So I dug in the wall, and behold, there was an entrance, and he said to me, go in. Now this is going into the inner court. Go in and see the vile abominations that are committed here, so I went in and saw, and there engraved on the walls all around every form of creeping thing and loathsome beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel. Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant denomination in the world, and what had been a restrainer of evil and an intercessory force in our world for many, many years. What did we find in the inner courts this last week? Not only men who were raping parishioners, men who were pastors, senior pastors, who were violating the, the wives of, of, of their subordinates. But then a massive cover-up. But God dug in the wall. Right now, by the hair of the head, the church is being held up and, and being forced to look upon this. And this is not the first one. He can't go in his house because of what we are doing there, because of what the pastors are doing in the house of God, because of what the leadership is doing in the house of God. It's no longer his house. You can read the rest of the chapter when you get home. It's almost too much to bear. In our church today, do I, do I need to mention what we do? First of all, just if you want to talk about the abomination in the very doorway, the, the uh, prosperity gospel, that's, that's right off the top, the prosperity gospel. Active homosexual men and women, active homosexual men and women in the pulpit being celebrated by their denomination. As their denomination says, finally we have arrived, look, look, finally... Homosexuals can preach the word. Greed, another book deal, another seminar that I can go and stand up. I'll never forget going to East Texas. It was a large church, a mega church. And the way they had the stage, there's no stairs like here. It was up a little bit higher than this one, and it, and it came all the way around. And the speakers, the elite, the men of God sat in their big overstuffed chairs. And the congregation was separated by this, by this dip. Men come with entourages to be celebrated and exalted in the name of God not. And there is, there is no access between the shepherd and the flock. 
There's no stairway nor a desire to be on the floor with the people. We'll hire somebody to take care of the sheep. I got a book to write. Greed. Not just in the pulpit, but ripping through the congregation. The Bible says that greed is idolatry. Disobedience. Everyone knows that God says, you don't divorce. And people sit in the church and hear that word and say, I hear it, but I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to do it anyway. Outright disobedience. Not to the pastor. I'm talking about outright disobedience to the word of God. Now we, we have marriages where there's two men standing there, two women standing there. Do you think God is there blessing that? Are we there yet? But worse than all of that, church, worse than all of those things that I have mentioned, is we are simply asleep. Asleep. It's not so much what we're doing. It's what we're not doing. Are we there yet? Is it the day of the Lord? What do you think? Are we there yet? If God, who dropped Sodom and Gomorrah for its sins, can he possibly allow this nation to continue to stand and still be just and fair? What do you think? Well, if so, Pastor, if you're right, and he has left the throne, and the blood is getting ready to flow in the streets, what do I do as a child of God? What do I do in those circumstances? Now, I, I want to introduce to you a topic. We're going to be covering that in detail, in depth, during the retreat for those three messages. We're going to be talking about how God's people live in exile. And I want you to, to be ready for that. You're getting an introduction right now. And then I'll, I'll talk about it at, at various times here. We'll, we'll have it here as, as well. In fact, I'll be here that Sunday of the retreat, and perhaps I'll just preach all three parts to whoever is here. But what, what do we do if before the retreat, he visits. <laughs> I think it's interesting. When I was growing up in the 70s, we were always praying for a visit of God. And I'm thinking today, maybe not such a good idea. But what do we do? As those of you whose hearts pant as the deer does for the water for your Lord, what do you do? I'm going to give you some do's and don'ts quickly. First of all, uh, let me just read this really quickly. Don't worry about what you will eat or what you will wear. From the mouth of Jesus, you can look it up when you get home, Matthew 6, 25 through 33. He says, don't worry about those things. Life is more than the body. And not only that, God will Provide. The first thing, don't worry about whether or not you're going to live or not. And let me just share this with you. Uh, when Augustine wrote his book about the city of God, it was because the destruction of Rome, the city, the capital city, which was also the capital of God's church, had been sacked by barbarians. And people were saying, wait a minute, we thought this was the city of God. We thought that we had a manifest destiny. And one of the arguments that Augustine presents to those that began to doubt God's existence 
he said, go look it up and see. <coughs> While they stormed the gates and they went through and set the city on fire. And as they raped from one end of the city to the other, as they slaughtered men and little boys, not one hair of the head of anyone who entered into any one of God's sanctuaries was touched. As the people entered the church, those who went into God's church, no one was touched. And you can look that up historically. God was right there in the middle of the slaughter taking care of his people, and he will take care of you too. So don't fear your, for your body. Last week, a 94-year-old woman was sitting in a car. Carjacker jumped in the car, pointed the gun at her. This is not a story. This really happened. 94-year-old woman. Why she's driving, I don't know. Maybe she doesn't have kids. I don't know. But he jumped in the car, pointed the gun at her, and said, give me your money. And she said, no. And he said, I'm going to shoot you. She said, I hope so. Because you pull that trigger, and I will be instantly in heaven. But what I'm afraid of, young man, I'm afraid you're going to go to hell. And he began weeping in the car, and she shared the gospel with him, and he accepted Christ. Don't be afraid about your body, but do be afraid. The same person in Matthew 10 says this. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Listen, church. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And don't be afraid of him coming, treading the grapes of wrath, if you're his. But if you're not, terror should be yours. What do we do? Uh, Genesis chapter 6, turn there very quickly. I'm sorry for going long, but this is a topic I think we need to cover. Genesis chapter 6. Starting in verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. <laughs> Let me read that again. Now, America was corrupt in God's sight, and America was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. Here's a day of the Lord coming. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And if you'll permit me, I want to paraphrase the next part. In original Hebrew it says, so Noah, build a boat. Build a boat, church. It's coming. Build a a boat. You'll notice here in this passage, he says, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark. Cover it. Build the boat by his plan, using his blueprints. He says in verse 17, For behold, I'll bring a flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, Noah. And you'll, you'll come into the boat you built. You and your family, your wife and your children and your daughter's husbands will all come into the boat. And I'm going to seal it up. And you're going to ride high on the storm. Well, Pastor, how, how do I build a boat today? Uh, first, ready? Your family gathered around the table 
with the Word of God open. Well, that's, I don't know, Pastor, that's a little... That's a little bit radical. Let me just put this picture in your mind. One day, the angel of death began trotting in Egypt. And as they heard, every time as he moved down the street, death hit a house, death hit a house, death hit a house. And the wailing of the mothers over their dead children or over their dead husband was breaking out across the city. And God had told the children of Israel, I'm coming, and death is coming with me. And here's what you are to do. And so the family first checked to make sure, Tommy, did you get the blood on all three parts, Tommy? How many times do you think the father went and checked? Did anyone wipe it off? And as the sound got closer and closer, they sat around the table, around God's promise, in fear and trembling and quaking. Church. When will you begin? Weaving the word of God into your children's hearts and minds around the table as if it matters. Reading the word of God to a family, discussing who he is, rather than March Madness brackets. Check the blood on the door. Am I saved? Is my, is my son saved? Is my wife saved? build the boat there. I'm going to get real radical. Church attendance. Church attendance. Listen, there used to be a saying when I was growing up, it went like this. My mom had me in church every time, what? The doors were open. My wife and I lived that. We drug our kids to church every time. The doors were open. My grandpa, till the day he died, if you it didn't matter, you were 60 years old, you came to visit him on Sunday, he drug you to church. And if you didn't want to go to church, you didn't stay in his house. Church attendance. Uh, one of the things when I think about that, going to church every time the doors are open, I look around and suddenly I'm grateful our doors are open every day except Saturday. Just maybe, church, have your doors open. But we have settled into a once a week. Once a week I go to church, I'm good. Huh? Let me tell you something. When he comes with blood-stained robes, do you think once a week is good enough? And then we, we skip every other week and holidays. And if I was up late drinking or overindulged or watched a movie late, or my kids have something scheduled, then it's okay. Hebrews 10.25, if there was ever a day when this verse should be read and understood in its context, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. All the more. Church attendance should be skyrocketing as death stalks our streets. But it's not. I'm just saying, for you, change that. Build the boat. Finally, with this thought, please. Build it publicly. Build it noisily. Slam the car doors when you're getting up on Sunday morning to go to church. Make sure all the neighbors go, oh man, the Roberts are going to church again. Honk the horn, wave at them, build it loudly. Walk around it, checking the timbers. Is there wood rot here? Is the seam tight here? Because the flood is coming. 
And when they ask you, why are you always working on that boat? Oh, friend, all hell is about to break loose. And me and my family, this is our sanctuary. And if you believe me, <laughs> here are the blueprints. Build your own. I'll help. I'll help. Jesus talks about a man who builds his house on the rock. I think if a church were going to have a building program today, this needs to be the building program. The Word of God woven hammered, meditated upon in our families, gathering together with the saints, praising God, supporting one another. And at the retreat, you'll hear how God has his people live as exiles. You may have heard something today where the Lord is talking to you and he's saying I need you to make some changes I need you to address this I want to give you a moment to reflect and to respond to him and something that we don't normally do I'm going to invite you to do today God has made us not only as spiritual characters but he has made us with physical bodies and I have found Praying out loud makes a difference between just praying in my head. That what is done with us physically, like the baptism, strengthens what we're doing spiritually. And so if there are families here that need to rededicate themselves to the Word of God, if there are individuals that maybe you need to talk to God about where you are, I want to invite you. I'm going to play some music will make this our altar and you get up and you walk with your physical body to make the commitment that's happening in your heart and mind and ask God to solidify this so that it doesn't fade by this afternoon.